Good day, dear friends. So good to be here with you, and thank you so much for inviting me into your places. And I pray that you've had a blessed week. I pray that you've been able to enjoy life. I pray that you have been able to enjoy family. And if you've been struggling in any way, shape, or form, I pray that you would put your full trust in God. So why don't we start today? And I want to talk to you about an article that I found on a website, an interesting name for a website, mentalfloss.com. There, a fellow by the name of David Brown, in an article, uh, takes a brief but interesting look at a book written by author Henry Petrosky, and the book is called The Road Taken. And Petrosky, in his book, tells the story of how the highways and rails came to be in the United States. And Brown picks up on some of the more interesting facts concerning the early stages of modern transportation. For example, as late as 1917, rural highways had no stripes of any kind painted on the pavement. It was just pavement. Because it was universally understood that drivers would hug the right side of the road to avoid each other. That is, until curves showed up. And curves in roads creates the tendency and the opportunity for drivers to swerve into uncoming, uncoming traffic. I think we all realize that. So back then, a decision was made that lines were needed. So the first center line was painted in 1917. As for choosing the color of the lines, this was up to designer Edward Hines, and after he had observed milk spilled from a delivery wagon onto a paved road, he chose white. Well, today, many years later, there are all sorts of lines paved on roads and different colors as well. And in many towns and cities, we will find traffic lights. And that's just the norm these days. And Brown talks about traffic lights in his article. And it seems that traffic lights way back in the day were invented by cops who were tired of almost being run over. Because you see, in those days, uh, cops, police officers, had to direct traffic by hand. And of course, you can see how that would be dangerous, a dangerous job at times. And many systems had been tried. Uh, one included a movable arm, just like the railroad, uh, you know, crossing a railroad track. But in the end, it came down to one Lester F. Wire. Officer Wire worked at a busy intersection in downtown Salt Lake City in 1912. And he designed a birdhouse out of plywood. He painted it yellow. He punched six inch holes on either side. He dipped bulbs in red and green paint and he used a manual switch to change the lights from green to red. By 1917, Salt Lake City had traffic signals at six connected, connected intersections. This was the first interconnected signal, signal system in the States. Now if you're wondering about the yellow light that we're so used to here in North America, um, I was also, but Brown helps us also, helps us here. One of the major problems of Officer Wire's invention was that drivers pretty well had to stop instantly when the, the light changed to red without any warning. There was an attempt to make uh, some delay with the green light for a few seconds after the red light came on to give some sort of warning before it would go red, but eventually it was the invention of another police officer in Detroit by the name of Officer William Potts. And he came up with a yellow light and it was added to, thankfully, I suppose, back then, it was added to the traffic light system by 1917. Kind of an interesting, interesting story. Please turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3, verse 10 to 14. We're going to read in chapter, uh, chapter 3 of Galatians. Actually, we're going to read from 1 right through to 14 for context. We'll be working with 10 to 14, but let's look at 1 to 14 so we get a, a picture and a context here. Chapter 3 of Galatians, verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly betrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? 
Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Verse 10. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the, books of, the book of the law and do them. Verse 11. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who will, will teach us and guide us. And I pray for each one of us here that are in hearing and seeing. Even myself, Lord, would you help me? Would you teach me? Would you guide me? Set me aside. Speak to us now through your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we pick up where we left off last week. Um, Paul, from verse 1 to 9, challenged the Galatians with four rhetorical questions. Four questions intended to shake the Galatian believers from their stupor. Uh, Paul said in verse 1 of chapter 3, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? In other words, who has beguiled you? Who has charmed you? Who has promised you salvation in anything other than the crucified Christ alone? So here in verse 10 to 14, Paul biblically refutes the Judaizers' case that the Galatian believers, Jews and Gentiles alike, were required to include the Mosaic law, and in particular for the Gentiles, circumcision. This workspace teaching, that's what this is, where there are something we, some things that we need to include in our salvation, such as works or self-effort or anything like that, alongside with the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, is unfortunately alive and well in the church today around the world. It's just more nuanced, sometimes even disguised. It's more layered. Unfortunately, it continues, and sadly, this often brings more confusion and division in the church than ever. And even more grievous has destroyed the faith of many. It has split churches and even created opportunities for spiritual abuse. Paul here in these four verses provided the biblical evidence and support that faith alone in the finished work of Christ alone is where one finds salvation. So let's put on our biblical thinking caps, pull them out, down tight around our ears, and keeping in mind the, the first rule of biblical study, context, 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 we need to understand that, Ju that the Judaizers would have appealed to the scriptures for their support. One commentator even suggests that the biblical reference Paul used here in verses 10 to 14, where we're working on today, were the very same ones used by the opponents in the Galatian churches. Again, the question is why? Well, the false teachers... Uh, we're pointing to the scriptures for scriptural support to prove the necessity for the Galatians to observe the law. And on the aside, fast forward to today, false teachers today are no different. They often appeal to the Bible for scriptural support for their error. Well, whether, this, whether or not this was the case, which seems to be more likely we do want to pay close attention to the text before us. Just moments ago, uh, uh, we were talking about uh, lines in the pavement and traffic lights. Can we ask you a question? Have you ever heard of a fork in the road? Fork in the road. You know, you're going down a road, and then you come to what is commonly called a fork in the road. And the decision needs to be made. Which road should you take, the one on the right or the one on the left? 
So what we have here in verse 10 to 14 is a fork in the road. And like any road, there are signposts along the way to help one decide which road to take. The one on the right or the one on the left. Also, we know that some roads are used more and some not so much. And here in verse 10 to 14, we have one road that has been well traveled on and one not so much. So which road should one take? The one which is well traveled or the other one that seems to be less traveled? And when we look over the text, we should also notice a contrast that Paul highlights. It begins here in verse 10, where Paul said, For all who rely on the work of the law are under a curse. And Paul used the noun curse three times and the adjective curse twice in three verses. And this contrasts with verse 14, where Paul used the word blessing. So we sum it all up. We have a fork in the road with some signposts, with one well-traveled road and the other not so much. And we find a contrast, curses and blessings along the road. So we turn now to the first of four signposts that we find here from verse 10 to 14. Paul, continuing from verse 9, said here in verse 10, you can read that with me, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. And then the apostle quotes Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 26, where he said, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Verse 10. The first signpost is found here in verse 10. It is the curse. And you might say, what curse? Or what is the curse? Well, let's turn to Paul's letter to the Romans for some clarification. Romans chapter 2, verse 12, Paul said this, For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Then in chapter 3, Paul said this concerning the law. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. That's Romans chapter 3, verse 19 and 20. You should mark that down. And just to clarify quickly, the word curse means to reject. To reject. Paul said in Romans 14, in reference to the law, the law brings wrath. Whose wrath? God's wrath. And I want, I want to pause here for a moment. And I, I want us to really face something that is prickly. And you might ask, what is that? Well, when we read about God's wrath, it can become a prickly subject for all sorts of reasons. And I would suggest that many today respond by keeping their distance from the Old Testament and focus on the New Te Testament teaching of God's love and mercy as found in his son, Jesus Christ. But my friends, here's the thing. We cannot separate the law from God. We cannot. The Bible doesn't allow that for us. Why? Because the law is, as John Stott put it, quote, the law is God's law the expression of his moral nature and will. What the law says, God says. What the law blesses and what the law curses, God blesses and God curses, end quote. So let's try and put this into some practical terms for you and me today. Keeping in mind that Paul settled it biblically. The Gentile who was not under the law and the Jew, who was, not under the, was under the law, are judged by the same law. Therefore, let me ask you this. Here's where it gets a little prickly. Have you ever lied just once? Have you ever used God's name in vain just once? Have you ever stolen, no matter what age, just once? Now, if you said yes to all three, that according to the law, this makes you a liar, a blasphemer, and a thief. And because you didn't abide by all the things written in the book of law, law, you will come under God's curse, under his judgment. So the first signpost is the curse, here in verse 10. The second signpost we find here is, is in verse 11. 
Please notice the first half of Paul's statement in verse 11 in a way summarizes verses 1 through 10, where Paul here says in verse 11, no one is justified before God by the law. It's settled. No matter how many biblical references the false teachers used in the Galatian churches for their scriptural support, no one, Paul said, no one can be justified before God by following the law. Then Paul, how can one be justified before God? And was this not the big question that was before the Galatians? Paul is asking them. And it's the same question that all people are facing today. How can one be in a right relationship with God? The Judaizers in in this context were saying, sure, Jesus is good, but one needed the law as well to be in a right relationship with God. And the Galatians should choose the well-traveled road of Judaism. This will get them to God in good standing. We look around and think about our world today, and we know that many people believe all roads, all kinds of roads lead to God. All roads will bring you and me into a right relationship with God in the end. And this signpost in verse 11, though, is about faith. And Paul adds a little ammunition to this by quoting Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. The righteous shall live by faith. Well, we need to go back to Romans chapter 3, verse 21. Starting verse 21, we read this. Paul said this. But now the righteousness of God has been made, has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. And further on down, he said this, For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. By faith in what? By faith in Jesus Christ. A lot of people have faith in their faith. But that's not faith. Faith demands an object. And Paul is saying the the righteousness of God is through faith in Christ alone. Verse 12, moving on, gives us a third signpost, and this is the law. Here Paul added to the strength of verse 11, and verse 11 reminds us that it's through only through faith in Christ that one is made righteous. And he adds here in verse 11 and verse 12, but the law is not of faith. One is made right with God by faith, therefore the law is not of faith. It has another purpose. And Paul goes on and quotes Leviticus chapter 18, verse 5. Now, if you were to go to chapter 18, the very first four or five verses, you will find that there God is speaking to Moses. He tells Moses to tell his people, he calls them Israel, to not live like the Egyptians where they once used to live, nor live like the people in the land of Canaan where he's bringing them. And he commands Israel this way. He said, follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. And Paul picks this up and quotes verse 5, the one who does them shall live by them. That's the law. Before we move on to the fourth signpost, uh, let's just recap the first three really quickly here. The first signpost we found in verse 10, it is the curse. The Bible teaches that one is not justified before God by the law. God's law is a reflection of God's moral nature, and all people have fallen short of keeping God's law. Therefore, all are, are, all, therefore, all are cursed and under judgment. Second signpost we found is verse, in verse 11, it is faith. The Bible teaches that those who are right with God shall live by faith in Jesus Christ. And the third signpost we found In verse 12, it is the law. And the Bible teaches the law is not of faith. Three signposts pointing to one of two roads. Purposely placed by the Bible, by the Word of God, at 5.8 miles before the fork in the road. Verse 13 and 14 now, Paul brings it all together. Brings it all together. He brings it to where Paul always went always went to the cross. Paul always went to the cross. Here we see clearly the contrast of curses and blessings. 
of law and faith, all wrapped up, all wrapped up in the cross. For the curse and the blessing, the law and the faith are of God. The cross is the fourth signpost at the fork in the road. Fork in the road. It's not 5.8 miles away. It's right there at the fork in the road. It's decision time. Do I take the well-traveled road or do I take the less-traveled road? Well, friends, the impact of what Paul writes here in verse 13 is, as one commentator put it, startling, almost shocking. Whether you know this or not, Everyone who was condemned by the Mosaic law and sentenced to death was usually stoned and then would be put on a stake or hanged on a tree as a symbol of divine rejection. Knowing this, Paul said this in verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse from, for us. He was rejected by God for us. And then he cites, for biblical support, he cites Deuteronomy 21, 23. I want to tell you a story, a true story. Cheryl Beckett was looking forward to an opportunity to join a medical team on a trip to uh, some of the remote villages in Afghanistan. See, Cheryl had lived in Afghanistan for approximately seven, six years before this opportunity came up for her to serve. And she had never done this. And over those years that she lived in Afghanistan, Cheryl served the people of Afghanistan by uh, teaching nutrition, working in women's clinics, wherever help was needed. And along the way, Cheryl would, from time to time, seize the opportunity to share her faith in Christ. She once said this to a friend, quote, I want to walk in faith in this place. We're not promised safety, but I know that there will also be beauty and fruit to walking in obedience to God. So Cheryl joined her teammates and uh, traveled into northern Afghanistan, and they had to go by foot over hills and through difficult terrain. Uh, the team ministered to villagers they met along the way. They provided basic dental, eye, and prenatal care. They comforted people, demonstrating the love of Christ with their kindness and their service. Well, three weeks went by, and the team packed up their belongings and began the long journey through the mountains by foot back back to Kabul. As they were hiking through the mountains, they came upon a group of armed Taliban insurgents. The team was taken by the Taliban into the woods and one by one shot to death. Why? Why? They were accused of being spies to spread Christianity. Well, Cheryl, Tom, Dan, Thomas, Karen, Daniela, Glenn, and Brian had chosen a less traveled road, the road of the cross. Friends, I share this story with you intentionally to, as best as I can, shock you, to startle you. You see, the signposts are all there for you and me to see. I'm not talking about Judaism per se. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about our context. Have you been beguiled by the culture? Are you in a stupor when the culture insists that you celebrate what God has condemned? Do you take the well-traveled road of least resistance? Or do you take the last traveled road? The road where you climb mountains and you cross rivers and you come up against wolves. You know like the one Cheryl and her friends did. Here's something else that Paul clearly points to in verse 14, my friends. Following Jesus Christ by faith is a blessing from God. It's a blessing. Your salvation was because God, and only God, kept his promise to Abraham. If you are in Christ Jesus, you are redeemed, that is, justified, and by faith, you have received the Holy Spirit. And here's the crux of the matter, my friends. The Christian life is a life lived in the power of the Holy Spirit, not in our own strength, not in our own will, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And just like Cheryl said, to remind us, we are not promised safety. I want to walk in faith in this, in this place. Four sign posts. Which road will you take? It's decision time. Let us pray. Our Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that before us we have these signposts. It's in the Bible. And Lord, clearly, clearly you have called your sons and daughters in the church to follow you wherever you take us, whether it be over hills or in the valleys or in between, to stand and stand firm in Christ. Lord, we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, thank you very much for inviting me in your places. God bless you. Shalom.